Hey there guys, the Network here, hope you've been doing well. So we will be diving back into the wonderful world of VLANs and firewall rules on this video. Now I specifically want to have a look at how we can restrict access on an inter VLAN level so that all traffic isn't just passed by default because maybe we don't want all of the VLANs to communicate directly with each other because it can pose a bit of a security risk, especially in today's IoT and DMZ world where you might have devices that are facing the internet that are directly accessible via the net. But if these networks become compromised, there's a good chance that bad actors can kind of piggyback off of other networks because everything just has full access. Now this video we will be looking at how to restrict this access and maybe you still want stuff like a management VLAN to have access to everything else. That's great, we'll, we'll look at doing that as well so that the management VLAN can get to everything else but we'll restrict access between all of the other VLANs. And this will be using the exact same network that we configured in the last VLAN video. So if you haven't watched that yet, I highly suggest watching that so you can see how the network is kind of structured. And then we can just set up our firewall rules and restrict access however we see fit. So let's get into it. All right, so let's just briefly revisit our topology from the previous VLAN video. If you want to see how everything was configured, I highly recommend watching that video. But just a brief summary, we have a couple of logical interfaces as VLAN interfaces that's bound to a bridge on our Microtech HAP AX3. And these are the VLAN IDs, but it's more important to note that these VLANs have IP addresses bound to them that any clients that are in that same VLAN are able to use as a default gateway. Because if you think about it, VLANs operate in the same broadcast domain, right? So that in essence means that any devices that's in the same VLAN can communicate directly with each other without the need for a router even. If you just had a switch and you had a bunch of devices in VLAN 10, they'd be able to talk to each other directly. They wouldn't need a router. However, if you want to talk to any other devices in other networks, in other VLANs potentially, or even to the internet, then you're going to need to introduce a router because a router's main function is to catch that traffic and it's also to stop broadcast traffic but it also needs to make forwarding decisions. It needs to say, hey, do I need to forward this traffic because it's not in my network? Or do I need to drop this traffic because I don't know where it is? Or is there some firewall rules that's applied to tell me what to do with the traffic? That is the wonderful bit about all of this. And that's also so cool about firewalls. If you think about it, it's, it's a lot like programming, even though a lot of networking stuff also feels like programming concepts. But with firewalls specifically, you have stuff like conditional formats. You have things like where you specify a condition where you can say, hey, if this criteria is matched, maybe if a source or destination is this address or network, then perform this action and this event will be triggered. So you could potentially reject traffic or drop it silently, or you could even do stuff like accept the traffic or add it to address lists or mark packets. There's all kinds of cool and crazy things that you can do with the firewall rules. It's really, really amazing. But it's nice to just understand visually how everything is configured and that we do want to use something like a layer three capable device like a router to forward the traffic. It doesn't in essence need to be a router specifically. It could be a firewall. It could be a layer three switch, but it has to be something that has a routing table and is possibly and preferably able to participate with firewall rules if you want to implement firewalling. And this is where it's also like very relevant that I have this HAP AX3, which if you look at it, it's a smaller device than the CRS326. It's got less ports, it's got less capacity, but it's got a stronger CPU. And if you're not aware of this, a lot of the firewall rules and the connection tracking is actually going to be using your Microtech CPU for that processing. Now, there's a lot of cool things that you can do like fast forwarding traffic that will kind of take a little bit of a load off of the CPU, but for most of it, if you're doing stuff like NAT rules or if you want the firewall rules to work properly, you need connection tracking and it is going to need a better CPU. And this is where it might be better to use something like the HAP AX3 as your router and as the device where you want to configure the bulk of your firewall rules, if not all of them, because it's just more suited for that purpose. It has a better CPU for that. Whereas this, <laughs> this switch at the bottom, that's potentially going to have a little bit of bottlenecking and you might have some issues if you want to run your firewall rules specifically from there. All right, cool. So let's actually log into Winbox 
and start fiddling around with some stuff. All right, so we're logged into Winbox and I can just quickly navigate to interfaces just to verify the details that I said before. I do have a single bridge interface. I have these logical VLAN interfaces that have been added to the bridge itself. And if I look at my IP address settings, we can see these are the IP addresses that have been bound to those VLAN interfaces. So I have something for my management, I have something for my servers, and I have something for my VoIP network. So great, we have our basic network prerequisites. Now let's head into the firewall rules. So let's hop into the firewall rules by getting into the firewall section on the marketing. So I can just head on to IP and firewall. And from here, we can see that I am currently using the default configuration that ships with the HAP AX3. And this is not like specifically to a certain model. Most MicroTix or router boards will ship with a default configuration that has this rule set on it. And this just kind of makes your router a little bit more secure from the outside, as well as just allowing some nice stuff like fast track from the beginning. However, it's not a requirement if you have a blank firewall rule set or you're not using the default configuration, that's totally fine as well, because you can tweak the stuff however you want to. But it's kind of nice to see what a device might look like that already has some firewall rules, because this brings us to one of the big, big points I want to mention from the very beginning when it comes to the firewall, it is all sequential. It is very important how you order your rules. The rules are read from top to bottom, and the moment traffic matches a rule, it will do whatever action that rule has told it to do. And if nothing matches that rule, then it will go into the next rule and the next rule and the next rule until it gets to the end. Now, the thing about most routers is when it reaches that end and there isn't an implicit deny rule set by the administrator, by us, then it's going to allow the traffic and just forward it through the rest of the routing process. Whereas if you look at something like a 40 gate or a open sense firewall, those devices by default does the opposite where they have an implicit deny rule by default and you as the administrator need to set everything you want to allow except if you want to be lazy and you allow everything but we want to specifically focus on our inter vlan communication and there's a few things that we also maybe just want to take note of um one thing i, I want to also just go into quickly and again if you don't know all of these details that's fine you can follow along or you could also maybe watch my MTCNA or MTCRE playlists on YouTube. It does cover the firewall a bit more in detail as well. I think MyCritic also released a few videos covering the firewall, which is pretty good. I can highly recommend that. Otherwise, please look at the documentation. It's also useful for figuring everything out. I use the documentation to figure things out. So let's get into the connections tab, because here we can actually see what is happening with each and every connection that passes either to or from or through this microtech. Now by default, connection tracking will be set to auto. You can set it to yes. If you turn it off, all that means is your device is no longer going to track any connections, so it's not gonna populate this table, which means your router is not gonna have a good time if you want to do stuff like NAT, or if you want to implement firewall rules because you might break things, <laughs> you'll definitely not have NAT working. So please keep that in mind but hopefully you don't need to come and tweak anything in here. I just wanted to show you what the table looks like because it's very useful to understand that there is this table where it's going to store all of the connections or all of the sessions, and it will say exactly what is happening when a connection is formed. You can see what a source address is, you can see what the destination is, you can see what protocol is being used to connect, uh, what, what the TCP state is, which is very useful because with the different states, there might be some ways you want to manipulate your rules to allow things that have already been established or things that are related to other connections, but you don't want to maybe allow new connections, which might be something that we're going to do in this specific video just now. But it's cool to see what is happening and how many bytes and such is being processed. If we head back into the filter rules, you can kind of see some of the same information as well if we just scroll a little bit to the right, where we can see how many bytes has been captured by a specific rule. And this is so useful to see, actually, because this lets you know exactly how many packets have actually gone through this firewall rule. And if you see it's sitting at zero, that just means that no traffic has actually hit that rule. So that's kind of like a rule that just never got used. And it might be safe to delete that rule, or you might have to just look at your rule structure and see why it's not maybe hitting that policy, because maybe you have things in the incorrect order. So that is also just some useful information for you. 
Now let's actually look at implementing some rules so that we can start blocking or allowing access between our different VLANs. Now, since this is IT or networking, there's definitely many different ways how you can approach this and do things. But I'm going to show you what I think is kind of going to be one of the most optimal ways that we can do the inter-VLAN routing or the firewalling at least. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to add a new address list. And in this address list, I'm just going to define all of my local networks that are bound to those VLANs. So maybe I could call this local networks and I can put in the IP addresses for my VLANs. So these VLAN networks, I'll just add to this list. So 10, 0, 0, 0, slash 24. Oh, that's the wrong thing. And then lastly, we're going for the same list, but we're defining this VoIP network. Cool. So now that I have all of these address, addresses bound to a single list, I can actually reference that single list in a firewall rule in order to drop access between the different VLANs. So I can click on the plus and I can just specify it is going to be the forward chain because it's traffic that's transiting through the microtick. And then we can set our source address. We're actually not going to set a source address here. We're going to specify the address lists. So here I can just use for both the source and destination, the local network's address list. So all that means if, if anything from any of those sources is trying to get to any of those destinations, it's just going to kind of drop the traffic. So if I go into my action, I can just drop this, apply it, and you'll notice that it does move it to the very bottom. So that is useful for us because maybe we do want that to be the very last rule that gets hit whenever traffic is trying to do anything. You also notice there is this default configuration item that says accept any established, related, or untracked connections. Now, what does that mean? Again, if we go to connections, we can see there are some connections that might be related or established between the connections we want. <clears throat> so I've actually got my own computer running on 192.168.99.254, which is in the management VLAN. And if I run a ping to 10.0.0.254, which is a laptop sitting in the server VLAN, um, it's timing out now. And it is going to kind of be because of this firewall rule. Here we can see it's timing out because that is considered a new connection. It's not a part of this accepted session list. If it was something that was accepted before and a connection was already formed, it would have just kept working. And we can kind of see how that works in action by just disabling this rule quickly. Then we should see that the ping starts working. So I just canceled, ran again, and here we can see the ping starts working. And if I re-enable the policy, do you think the ping is going to drop or is it going to still keep running? So if I enable, we can go back. <clears throat> and here we see it does continue to just be live. And the reason if, is if we go to the connections tab, we can see the connection in the table. It's currently there. I'm, I've got it highlighted and it is currently live. So it's considered it is an established or related session at the moment. So this is why it's not dropping that because it's actually being hit by this firewall rule. But again, if I stop my pings and I maybe clear out the table here, you could also maybe reboot the router if you really needed to, but I'm not going to do that just for this demonstration. So I just uh, destroy those sessions. And if we do the ping again, there we see, technically we've now blocked all inter VLAN traffic. So these devices can't communicate with each other for anything now, but we could maybe make that a little bit more better for us. Maybe we can specify if it is any new sessions, that's what we want to drop, but anything that's also already related or um, established those things we might want to allow. So, we can go back here and we could just say any new sessions or new connections. That's actually what we want to drop. Now you could leave it as all, that's also totally fine because if you put in, if you start working with stuff like sessions, you might accidentally also allow things unintentionally, but this should really be pretty decent for any type of new things that you want to do because now we can at least define things a lot better for the rest of the other rules because I could potentially now say, add a new rule. <clears throat> and here I can now define specific things. Now you could still use some address lists or add multiple address lists for different type of networks. 
But here I'm going to now specify the source and addresses directly. So I might say anything that's coming from my management network, so 192.168.99.0/24, wanting to go to my server's network, which could be my IoT or DMZ or something, this I'm going to accept. And I could also just maybe make this any new sessions because I've already got a rule that's allowing anything else that is established, related, or untracked. But again, it is very important, the sequencing, because I need to make sure that this rule is maybe being accepted before it's getting denied by the rule just above it. So I could just drag and drop this, and I might put this right below the fast forward rule, so just above the other forward rule. So now it is saying anything from my management network to my DMZ or my servers, I'm going to accept that, and then anything below that will, in essence, become also established or related. So it will also just allow those ICMP returns from the server network. But anything else will get blocked. So I can test this. Actually, I don't even need to test it. The ping was running and it's already working. There we can see I'm running a ping and it is going through. However, very important, is it working from the server side? So sorry if you just see me disappear from the camera for a second. I'm just going to jump to the laptop quickly. And I'm going to just go to this connections tab and I'm going to try and initiate a connection from the laptop. So, <laughs> sorry, I'm back. And here we can actually see that I am trying to run a connection from this laptop back to the server. And it's actually just failing at the moment. I'm getting a bunch of timeouts. And we could potentially see that by either running maybe a packet capture, but the quickest way is also for me to just run another test to something else to make sure that the device in the server still has internet access. So now I'm also just quickly running a ping from the laptop to Google's DNS, and there we can see we are actually able to get out to the internet from the DMZ or the server VLAN. However, the server VLAN is not able to get to the management network. But very importantly, the management network can get to the server VLAN. And I could do the same thing by just double clicking on here, copy this rule, and then I could maybe just make some small tweaks. I could say if the destination is going to be the VoIP VLAN, so 172.16.00/28, I could do the same thing. I could accept that. And then that would now, in essence, allow access from my management VLAN to my VoIP as well. And it's going to drop anything between those VLANs to each other, as well as from those VLANs to maybe not like my management VLAN, because I think, like I said in the introduction, maybe you have some services that's pointing to the internet that might get compromised. And obviously you don't want, if bad actors are able to access those devices, you don't want them to get to the rest of the network because you're just going to make more issues and it's just going to spread like wildfire. So the moment you can tie things down a bit better like this, the better for you, especially if it's just like management can get to anything, but everything else should be as restricted and as limited as possible. And I think this is really like a basic rule set that I've just applied here. If you want to be very granular, you can do that. You don't need to do this catch all address list thing that I did here. You can click on the plus and specify exactly what your source addresses and destination addresses are. If you want to be that granular, you can do that. Nobody is going to stop that. It's not a wrong thing to do. So you could say, uh, if anything is from 10, 0, 0, 0, slash 24, wanting to go to my management network, <clears throat> I want to drop that. And you could also leave it just in all states, or maybe you, you can say any new states. We're going to drop that. And you can copy paste these rules just to make it a lot quicker for yourself if you really want to do it on such a granular approach. But using a address list like this is pretty fine and straightforward if you just want to be quick, neat, and easy because this takes a lot less rule space if you think about it. Now, I don't have these multiple rules where this one rule does exactly kind of the same thing. All right, so this is going to be where I'm going to end off the video. I think I've shown you how to do some intra VLAN firewalling. Again, I highly recommend looking at some of my other firewall videos. If you want to get a bit more in depth detail on how to configure firewall rules and what some of the other options are, but I'd like to thank you for viewing and I'll catch you in the next video. See ya.